All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, this is Windows Server Containers for Cloud Foundry. Hopefully, this is where you want to be. Promise it'll be interesting. Uh, so my name is Sanjay Bhatia. I'm an engineer at Pivotal, working on the Garden Windows team. And I'm Matt Horn, software engineer at Pivotal, also working on the Garden Windows team. So what have we been working on? Uh, part of our uh, mission here as, as the Garden Windows team is maintaining the uh, Windows 2012 R2 stack. So if you want to push your um, .NET applications to a Windows 2012 VM, uh, we maintain the Garden uh, implementation for that stack. Uh, what we've implemented in the last um, year since our last uh, appearance at the summit, um, build packs, thanks to our um, friends at HP for the initial work on that. Um, we added a configurable HTTP TCP health check to match Linux instead of the default mode that was just HTTP. Um, we've improved on the bind mount implementation. Uh, you enabled the use of instance identity credentials on Windows 2012, um, some various security enhancements, and we now have a CF deployment ops file that you can use. Um, in addition, we've, been, we've implemented the Windows 2016 stack. As you can see, a screenshot of our lovely CF stacks um, there. Um, now we have two times more Windows stacks than Linux. Not bad for a year's work. Yeah. So why have we been doing this? Um, we've envisioned a first-class .NET developer experience on CF. We want to enable .NET developers just as in the same way that Java developers are enabled with the Linux stack. Um, we want to reduce the burden of leveraging Windows on CF. Um, part of that was uh, helped by our, the Bosch Windows team. We can Bosch deploy Windows cells, but containers on Windows is a really important part of that. Um, so Windows 2012 is, gets us part of the way. We um, implemented that stack that enables a lot of legacy applications, a lot of .NET developers. But one of the thing, some of the things that um, the platform uh, enables for Linux, like container-to-container -container networking, pushing OCI images, OCI build packs, volume services, those things are not really feasible on Windows 2012, and we want to enable those for .NET developers. Cool. So uh, there are some shortcomings with that 2012 stack that we had out there for a number of years now. Uh, basically, those, those containers or containers uh, are pieced together using uh, job objects, the Windows firewall, file system ACLs. All these things are relatively limited. Job objects weren't really intended to be used for containers. Job objects were, were meant to be similar to Linux process groups. So you could say these processes are related to each other in some way, and then you can kill them all at once. Right? So job objects were a nice way to approximate containers, and, and we could apply resource limits to some degree with them. But they really didn't deliver everything that you'd expect from containerization, especially compared with Linux. The Windows firewall is uh, relatively limited. Uh, well, it, it's actually quite extensive what you can program it to do, but there are some serious limitations like not being able to firewall localhost. And so a process running a container on Linux can talk to processes running on the host uh, over localhost. And so if you're trying to protect your uh, server from unauthorized use, uh, maybe you're deploying Cloud Foundry and you have components like the rep or Metron or console. Uh, you don't want containers to be able to talk to those processes. You can't stop that from happening via TCP on, uh, on Windows. And then file system ACLs, uh, while they're great, you still have a global file system. And so file system ACLs work pretty well, uh, but they're, they're not as good as a container isolated file system. There's a, a real lack of true isolation and resource limiting. There's a shared system registry. And so if you have a legacy application that's writing to something like uh, HQ local machine, uh, or you're writing to a user registry, you, it, it's really, you're gonna have a bad time. It's just not, it's not good. Uh, that shared file system, if you accidentally write some files to like a temp directory, it's global. And so unless you've set the temp environment variable correctly, you might end up writing files to the same place as some other container, and that can really lead to some problems. 
In fact, we saw issues with that in, in early uh, iterations of the project. There's shared network interfaces, and so you, can, you can't uh, firewall localhost. And you can't set network bandwidth limits. So if you have a really bad actor and maybe you're running a multi-tenant public cloud, Windows is really not a good fit for that deployment. We also didn't implement uh, CPU limits in the 2012 R2 stack. Job objects do have the concept of applying a CPU limit. However, it's percentage-based. And uh, when you're trying to deploy you know, N containers, trying to divide up that share-based load via percentages becomes really hard. Uh, we also saw problems when turning on CPU limits uh, where they, they just weren't sufficient in that uh, containers couldn't even get themselves started if we applied CPU limits. You just have so little uh, CPU allocated to you via that percentage that uh, we ended up shutting off CPU limits in the 2012 offering. And the isolation primitives are, well, primitive. Uh, so there's a, a known exploit uh, in the job object uh, kernel, kernel call uh, known as inconsolable. Uh, this was documented by uh, the Google Project Zero team in some work that they were doing for the Chrome browser. Chrome actually uses job objects to uh, do, do all the limits that are applied to Chrome on Windows. Right? And so this conhost uh, exploit allows you to start processes outside of the job object that you started in. And so when we're using job objects to apply memory and you know, other limits to your container, if you can just start a process outside of that, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Now what you can do is monitor the process tree and look for processes that start up outside of a job and then put them back in the job. That's exactly what we do. We have a process called the guard, but that's reactive, right? And so when you're building a, a system that's meant to scale, you don't really want to have a bunch of reactive processes putting things back in job objects. Right? So how do we improve the experience? Um, we want to improve the experience for app developers, give them more isolation. We want to also, major point here is we want to improve the experience for CF component teams. Uh, Windows 2012, the implementation is built on top of IronFrame, which is a .NET library. Um, it requires Visual Studio, MS Build, lots of workstation setup, and onboarding becomes hard for new members for the Garden Windows and other teams that want to interact with the Garden Windows implementation. So we want to improve that experience as we go forward as well. I think we went like three months without a workstation that even had Visual Studio installed on it, and when we had to do a thing to IronFrame, it's like really painful. Um, and so how, how do we improve the experience? So we want to leverage the Windows Server 2016 stack. Uh, Microsoft, Microsoft is working with win, uh, to implement Windows Server containers. Um, containers are now a native concept to Windows and Windows 10 and Windows Server 2016. Um, in concept, they're similar to Linux containers. Um, there's a version with a shared kernel, which is what we use, and there's also the, quote, Hyper-V um, containers that are use, uh, suitable for uh, multi-tenant workloads, according to Microsoft. And we want to bring these to Cloud Foundry. Uh, in addition, we want to adopt existing Cloud Foundry development patterns, we want to have all our components in Golang, um, want to integrate with the Garden team um, more deeply and use Garden Run C release and Guardian so there's no longer a separate Garden Windows Bosch release. And we want to try to adopt industry standards with containers try to take advantage of the open container initiative, um, the runtime spec, the image spec, and emulate the Linux version of the runtime plugin, which is called RunC, and we um, implemented our own called WinC. So what were our design goals when building the 2016 stack? Uh, so we focused initially on Windows Server 2012 parity. Uh, so we weren't trying to bring new features to the platform. We just wanted to deliver everything that we had before. So initially, we're only supporting the build pack app lifecycle. There's no Docker app lifecycle yet. We support application security groups uh, just like we do in 2012. These are currently implemented via Windows firewall rules, but more on that later. We have resource limits uh, just like you had in 2012 for memory and disk. And we're really targeting that same class of applications to be deployed. So we're, we're not uh, initially supporting the nano server image. Microsoft has two 
root file systems for 2016. There's Nano Server and there's Windows Server Core. Nano Server is great, uh, but it's more like uh, maybe Alpine Linux, right? You can have this tiny base image. Now, tiny to Microsoft is 200 megabytes. Uh, so, you know, tiny, tiny base image versus uh, Windows Server Core, uh, which is a much larger image. Uh, but we didn't want to require app developers to rewrite their apps to take advantage of this new stack. And so, most applications that are currently targeting the Windows.NET uh, desktop CLR runtime, uh, you, you need things that are in that server core image. And so, our initial support will just be that server core. And maybe we'll have Nano Server some other day. We wanted an improved experience for .NET developers. So that, that isolation, right? The isolation primitives in 2012 are really primitive. Uh, so we wanted better isolation. We also wanted to bring CFSSH to the Windows, uh, the Windows stack. Right now, it's really difficult to debug Windows applications when they're running on the 2012 stack. And we know from our experience with Java and Linux that developers really like being able to SSH into their container and do whatever they need to in there to figure out what's going on with their apps. So we wanted to bring that to the platform. We also wanted to enable more of the existing platform features, like container networking and Diego persistence. With 2012, it's been you know, basically impossible to support uh, either of these because we didn't have isolated container networks. And we didn't have isolated disk, right? And so with 2016, we can bring these features to the platform. We also wanted to set ourselves up for future uh, platform opportunities. Things like sidecar containers, uh, which you might have, might have heard about in some of the initiatives that are being talked about this week, uh, and OCI build packs. So what does the 2016 uh, server implementation give us? Um, we have complete file system isolation. So each container runs in a uh, virtual disk volume um, that is booted as a sandbox from the container image. Um, the root of the container's um, file system is the root of this volume. It does not get to see anything outside of the container volume unless it's bind mounted in. And bind mounts are uh, read only by default. Uh, and with this, we, are, we have a container rootFS, unlike on Windows 20, 2012, where we were just on the host. Um, this follows the Linux patterns for security updates and deployments. We have a rootFS that's packaged in a Bosch release. Um, if there's a security vulnerability in .NET or some other component of the rootFS, we can roll a new, build a new Bosch release, um, ship it, and you can redeploy and have your patch in as long as it takes you to Bosch deploy yourself. Um, it sim simpli simplifies the Bosch stem cell as well. So no longer do we have to have the application dependencies like the .NET framework installed in the host stem cell. We can now have them in the container rootFS. Um, and there's more about this on the next slide. So here we have a lovely diagram from our PM, William Martin. Um, you can see the bottom layer of this um, rootFS is the Windows Server container image that Microsoft provides. Um, the, we install some .NET features, some Windows specific stuff, .NET modules, the URL rewrite module, for example, um, some utilities, and you can see in the orange there the, an example of where your um, application droplet will live with the build pack application all compiling together to be, become your droplet. Yeah, so one of the things that we kind of heard from a lot of users of the 2012 stack was like, where do I put my DB2 module, right? And like, this was never a fun thing to say, well, you build a special stem cell and you put it in there and then you deploy that, right? It's not a great experience, especially compared to, to Linux. Uh, so now we can say, hey, well, you put it in your, your rootFS, right? Uh, or you put it in your build pack. So some more improvements we have with the Windows 2016 stack, we have now have CPU limits, and Microsoft has implement, implement, bleh, implemented them directly in the uh, host compute service with shares. So you're able to do the sort of CPU limiting you would require for applications to start up and for application CPU sharing to um, continue as on Linux. Uh, users are unique to each container. So before, containers were implemented with a user 
on the host in Windows 2012. Now contain, uh, users are unique to each application container. And now you also have registry isolation, which is very important for these legacy apps that people will be pushing to the um, platform. Each uh, container has a copy, uh, its own copy of a registry, and each layer of a container file system actually has a diff between the, itself and the previous uh, layer registry. Uh, we also have network compartments, which are pretty much akin to Linux namespaces. The processes no longer listen on the host's IP. They have their own uh, uh, loopback interface for the container. And container processes cannot communicate with the host unless we explicitly allow them over the network um, with the firewall rule. Cool. So we have a couple architecture diagrams to talk through. They were drawn by our PM and literal architect, William Martin. So here's a, a high-level diagram of what actually runs on a Windows cell. Right? So ultimately, everything uh, that's on a cell is deployed via Bosch, and that gets there via the Bosch agent. We have these components uh, on the left of the diagram, the rep, the Metron agent, console client, and the route emitter. All these components are, are written in Go. Uh, we are currently using all of those components in the 2012 stack as well as the 2016 stack. So for the most part, uh, all the components that make up the 2016 stack are tried and true. We already know these things work well on Windows. We have a deployment mechanism for them. And we've seen them working in production very well over the last uh, two, two and a half years. On the right uh, is the new bit of uh, Windows 2016 stack, which is Guardian, or it comes from the Garden Run C release. And Guardian is the, uh, the, the bit of the platform that actually runs the Windows containers. So you can see it consists of, uh, of a Garden server, a container plugin, a network plugin, and a rootfs plugin. We'll dive in a little bit to what those mean. Uh, you have the, uh, the Gardener server, which is implementing the Garden API. The Diego uh, component talks to the Garden API and says, hey, I need you to run these containers. right? So that's our standard API. That's exactly what we're using in 2012. And in 2016, instead of writing yet another Garden release, let's see, we had Garden Linux release, Garden Run C release, Garden Windows release. We didn't want Garden Windows 2016 release. So we went back to the Garden team and we said, hey, is there a better abstraction we can build here? Uh, and we found a place to push that down uh, to a lower level. And Sanjay mentioned this uh, around OCI and adopting uh, standards. And so with the Garden Run C release, we have this server, the Gardener, that implements the Garden API. And that server has three subcomponents, the containerizer, the external networker, and the image plugin. The containerizer is where we saw an opportunity to leverage a lower level abstraction to implement Windows Server containers. So we saw an opportunity to implement the OCI specification on Windows. This is the Open Container Initiative. It's a standard that defines how containers should be created, maintained, their life cycle, destruction, et cetera. So we wrote a CLI implementing the OCI spec for Windows called WinC. WinC talks directly to Windows host compute service. And this allows uh, spinning up and spinning down of containers, putting stuff in containers, that whole life cycle. For networking, we wrote a networking plugin, Wink Network, which talks to the host network service. This sits alongside in Windows land the host compute service. And for images, this is that rootfs. Right now, we just have a dummy Wink image uh, plugin, which gives you access to a root file system that's installed on the host. All right, now time for a demo. Uh, so, for example, so here we can see this is our ops file. We have deployed uh, Cloud Foundry and some Windows cells, Windows 2016 cells, we're using this ops file. This is in Master of CF deployment on the latest releases, so you can take a look at this and use it if you want to. And here, so if we look at our stacks, we can see our Windows 2016 stack right there. And we've pre-pushed a couple applications. We have a 2012 app, Nora 2012. Nora is our equivalent to the Linux test app Dora for Windows. We have a Dora and a Windows 2016 app.
You're missing a D oh. or an N. All right, we can see it's running on the Windows 2016 stack with the HWC build pack. And let's do the most interesting thing and SSH to this app. So this should Wait put, for it. Yeah, this should put Whoa. you in a uh, command shell session up in GCP. This is actually running on a uh, server in GCP. Um, and so what do we want to do here? We can look around our directory. Oh, look, there's our application directory. Oh. Users be capture. No subfolders exist. Let's go to PowerShell. Takes a little while. But it takes a little while on Windows normally. Oh. So there's our application uh, files. And let's try to install a Windows feature. Let's see if we can run uh, containers in containers. This will hopefully autocomplete for us. Nice little progress bar. Oh, we're not admin, so we cannot install Windows features here, which is pretty good. Um, let's see. Let's try to open a notepad. Uh, oh, it doesn't open notepad. We can't see that. But if you look at the process list, you can see a notepad up there, which it's running somewhere. We can't see it, but it's running. Um, <laughs> We can see our PowerShell session. Uh, and so if you notice, let's see if we can scroll a little bit. How do we scroll here? So we can't see any of the, the Bosch service processes, which is good. We're pretty showing that we're just running inside of a container. We can't see the um, system host processes. Um, what else? We can see our. Oh, No subfolders exist. Let's got to look at the files. You can see our, whoa. I think you need not the dot slash. Not the dot slash. PowerShell. Oh. oh. Well. I don't know. Well, you can look around your, you can look around your uh, container file system. You can get instance identity credentials. You look, can look at all the processes inside of your container. And we're not admin, which is pretty good. Cool. Awesome. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Windows Server semi-annual release channel. Uh, there, the Microsoft team is actually moving to, uh, instead of these gigantic monolithic releases like once every four years, uh, they're moving towards this semi-annual release channel every six months. So you've seen this in Windows 10 with the uh, anniversary update and the creators update. So they're targeting basically every six months to do these major releases. Uh, 1709, you might think, oh, that's 2017 September. It's October. Where's that release? Any day now, promise. Uh, but we've been actively working with the Windows Server Containers team to deliver new functionality in Windows. We've seen major networking and perf performance enhancements in Windows Server Containers in this semi-annual release channel. There's improved process isolation. That conhost breakout that we mentioned uh, is, is mostly mitigated now. Uh, it's still sort of possible, but uh, you, you can really contain it. There's also improved CPU sharing. We see a smaller root FS, just 2.2 gigabytes. To give you an idea, that's currently 5 gigabytes. And sidecar containers. So you can have uh, two containers that are stood up next to each other that have the same network and can, can communicate with each other, but are still separate containers. 
So some areas that still need improvement in our Windows 2016 implementation. Uh, memory limits, as in 2012, still do not constrain memory map files. So you could potentially take up a host, uh, whole memory with a large memory map file. Um, this is something we're working on with Microsoft, but there are no uh, process limits, so you can run as many processes as you want in a container. Um, that's on the roadmap for the Windows Server Containers team. And containers are semi-privileged, so if you uh, elevate from the default VCAP user, that is a non-admin user inside of your container, if you elevate to administrator, you can get around disk limits, which are implemented currently as a quota on your um, disk volume. Um, and you can also get around the network access restrictions. This networking stuff will be fixed in the part of the 1709 release as the networking team has done a lot of work and now have uh, network access control lists for network endpoints. Future roadmap items. We're working with uh, the GroupFS team for OCI or Docker image push support. We're also thinking about a true upstream support in concourse for Windows workers. Right now, there's a separate Bosch release that stands up a Houdini-based worker, uh, but we want to have real Windows Server container workers. And we're also thinking about nano server image support. Uh, but first, we need multi rootfs so see the point about working with rootfs. In terms of uh, isolation that Sanjay mentioned earlier, right now we just have shared kernel isolation implemented. And this is similar in principle to 2012 R2 and Linux. Uh, in the future, we might think about adding Hyper-V isolation. Uh, it's not implemented today. Microsoft says Hyper-V isolation is intended for hostile multi-tenant workloads. Uh, what they're actually using this for is the Azure container service and isolating processes. However, uh, Hyper-V isolation requires nested virtualization support, which is not supported by all IaaS's, although I think it was GCP that just announced last week to have this option. Not for Windows yet. Though. Not for Windows, okay. Uh, but these containers are very heavyweight, uh, so standing up one container took three gigabytes of memory. And so in talking with our operators and seeing what they're used to from the Linux experience in 2012 R2, Hyper-V isolation is kind of crazy. But as I mentioned, Microsoft is working on making these things better, and so I expect this will improve over time. We actually have seen improvements in the semi-annual release already. It's down to two gigabytes. So uh, call to action. What can you guys do? Uh, we are hiring at Pivotal and Cloud Foundry, so give us a call if you want to work on Windows, work on Windows containers. Uh, we love pull requests. All of our um, WinC uh, Guardian code, of course, is open source. Uh, if you take a look, see some bugs, uh, give us a call. Um, and definitely start using WinC, Guardian, uh, Garden Run C release on Windows. And uh, take a look at our CF deployment ops file, um, give it a whirl, see, see if it works for you. Um, more pull requests there open as well. Cool. Any questions? would like to ask how the uh, licensing uh, topic is covered. What, if I have, want to have a, a Windows stem cell, do I have to bring my own license and how to yeah. integrate it? Great question. Uh, so licensing is, is one of the tough points here, of course, with Windows Server. Uh, and so for you know, the, the Bosch deployment right, of, of uh, Cloud Foundry, you need to figure out your own licensing. You need to bring that along. Now, if you're using something like Azure, GCP or AWS, uh, that licensing is included in the cost of the VM if you stand up a Windows VM. Uh, now, for your own IaaS, like uh, vSphere or OpenStack, you've got to figure that out on your own. Now, for the containers, uh, it's my understanding that you can, you can create as many of these Windows Server containers, the lightweight containers, as you'd like. Right? So if you have a Windows Server license, you just bring it up. Those aren't charged at that you know, per CPU or per, uh, per socket licensing basis, right? And so you just start up as many containers as you want on a server once you have it running, which is basically the same uh, concept in licensing that Microsoft has for if you have, say, uh, ESX host and you're running Windows VMs on there. You license the physical host, 
and then you run all the VMs on there that you want. And the public IS stem cells, they're all available on Bashio, so you don't have to build them yourself. You can just get the download link, and those will uh, be a valid stem cell that you can use. And uh, coming soon to CF deployment will be the opportunity to use an offline and an online Bosch release to get the rootFS. So by default, there will be an online release which will download the rootFS from the internet for you. And if you have um, constraints on having internet in your environment, then you can use the offline op file, which requires a couple manual steps to build the release for you. We already have um, scripts and code in the release source for, and instructions for you to build the Bosch release and you upload it yourself and then after that it's just a usable Bosch release and it deploys as normal. Cool. I think we're at lunch time now so I don't want to keep you from that but go ahead and find us after this if you have any more questions. We'll be around. <laughs>